Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. So good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Man, God is good. Amen. Amen. Um, for those of you that haven't had a chance to watch our our redemption hour that we had yesterday, you can catch it on YouTube. Just go to Majesty Worship Center to our YouTube page and um, you can check it out. It was awesome. I had a we had my brother and my sister along yesterday. It was it was good. It was awesome. We had a lot of fun. Amen. God is good. Everybody ready for Christmas? Other than me. You know when I say, "Are we ready for Christmas?" A lot of people think, "Oh, I have a lot of shopping to do." A lot of people. A lot of people think, "Oh, well, man." You know, I have to get to the store, I have to buy this, I have to buy that, and I need to get everybody gifts and stuff. What I'm talking about is, are we ready for Christmas? Are we ready to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? You know, people always um, say, well, he wasn't born on December 25th or whatever, I mean, it's okay. You can celebrate it any day you want. I mean, we are to celebrate His birth, His death, and His resurrection. Amen. Because without one of them, the other one couldn't exist. Whether it was in July, whether it was in December, it really doesn't matter. Is that we know that it did happen, mm -hmm. and it did exist. Mm -hmm. But what I like about this time of year is because the whole world <coughs> acknowledges my Savior, whether they believe in Him or not. On this specific day, it's in a national calendar, so come on. The world acknowledges the birth of my Savior. Acknowledging that it did exist. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. That's not my sermon. <laughs> praise God. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we just give you all the praise, honor, and glory this evening. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would speak through me tonight. That it would be your word and not mine. Holy Spirit, just have your way. Have your way and touch us all. Change us from the inside out, Heavenly Father. Father, we just thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So you got your Bible, turn to Psalms 41. I've been pondering on this psalm for since Saturday. Since Saturday. And, and I'm like, man, I have read it several times, but it just really touched me this time that it was, because I believe it was really speaking to me. So we're going to go ahead and read it, read uh, all 13 verses, and then we're going to try to break it down the best way we can, okay? So the word of the Lord says, blessed is he who considers the poor. The poor will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed, bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. My enemies speak evil of me. When will he die and his name perish? And if he comes to see me, he speaks lies. His heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes out, he tells it. All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt. And evil disease they say cling to him, and now that he lies down, he will rise up no more. Even my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be merciful to me, and raise me up, that I may repay them. By this I know that you are well pleased with me. Because my enemy does not triumph over me. As for me, you uphold me in my integrity 
and set me before your face forever. Amen. Amen. Such an awesome, awesome song. So David's message in Psalms 41 speaks of of like if you're being in an ICU unit, if you're being in a critical care unit. So the whole chapter, the whole chapter recognizes human compassion, reveals in God's care for the for the compassion, requests grace, help, and forgiveness, rehearses the meanness, meanness that he has, reveals in God's care for him personally, recognizes divine compassion. That is, is just so amazing. Let me get this up here. Give me one second. You know, as, as, as You know, let's go to verse 41. I mean, verse 1. Bless he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. First Peter 4.8 4, says, And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. We can easily see from the scripture in First Peter that God wants us to be charitable. He especially wants us to be charitable to those who are worse off financially than we are. The best example of this in the Bible was Jesus. He healed the lame, gave sight to the blind, opened deaf ears, and fed the multitude. What are we doing with the things that the Lord has given us, with the things that the Lord has blessed us with? We know that even the leper who People avoided was touched by Jesus and healed. One of the parables that Jesus told about helping those in need was the parable of the Good Samaritan. You guys remember that parable? You know what was so awesome? On Saturday, we went and, and visited with uh, Darlene's father. And amazing man, amazing individual. And then now we get praise reports that he's, he's doing well. He's actually getting off of the bed and he's doing things and he's walking and, and he's not feeling that same pain before. I mean, you couldn't even touch his feet without him having pain. And as Brother Ed was sharing with us and showing us pictures and stuff of him walking now and, and he's not feeling that same pain was just a blessing to show that God's at work. It's not that we showed up, it's that the Lord showed up Amen. and did what he does best Amen. to show this man the love and compassion that he has for him. To show this man that he is still in the business of healing. Yes, yes. It's not a coincidence that sometimes we get sick and the doctors can't find anything wrong with us. But let me tell you folks that sometimes we've got to check our heart. Where is our heart at? Because sometimes the burdens that we carry make us physically sick. And no x-ray machine, no MRI machine, no nothing in that magnitude is going to be able to track anything that's spiritual. Something that's there that, that, that is, you know, we carry so many burdens on our backs that it weighs us down and then sometimes it causes us to have pain in our bodies it causes us to get sick see because we were never meant to carry those burdens those burdens were meant those burdens were already nailed to the cross but we still choose to carry them thinking that we know better than God and that we got it all taken care of but I'm here to remind you that we don't we have to allow God to do what He does best. 
So in verse 2 it says, The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. We cannot outgive God. If you give to the poor, God will give back to you. If you pray for the sick, God will keep you healthy. If you give a place of rest to, to someone homeless, you shall always have a bed. Whatever you do for someone else, God will always reward you for it. You cannot give God directly, but when you're doing something for someone else, it's like doing it unto the Lord. Of course, saint and sinner alike have troubles from time to time. But God will help those who have generosity in their hearts. Be a generous person. Be a generous giver. Because we've got to remember that when we die, your 401k, they ain't going to send you a check to heaven. The stuff that you have in the bank or, or all the, the stuff that we're accumulating here on earth, it's just going to belong to somebody else. And sometimes we're holding on to things, and I'm not saying it's not, it's, it's okay to have nice things, but sometimes we hold on to them, and that becomes our identity. Our identity starts to become the things, our possessions, instead of our identity in Christ. Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So is our ways pleasing to the Lord? Are we pleasing to the Lord in our conduct, in the way we conduct ourselves on a daily basis, in the way we talk, in the way we speak? Can, can people notice who we are? Can people notice that there's something different in us that, that they don't have? That's how we are supposed to display the gospel. Have I ever told you guys that I love Mondays? Because Mondays is one of the biggest days of ministry for me. Because it's an opportunity. Because everybody, I don't know why they hate Mondays, but they just can't stand Mondays. You tell somebody good morning on Monday, they're like, oh, it's Monday. I'm like, well, what does that have to do with it? Man, you have a job, you're healthy. I mean, what more do you want? Right? It could be a lot worse. I start telling them we could both be in the unemployment line in line right now, or maybe in line waiting to get a food box, but we don't have to be. So I'm telling you right now that we're having a pretty good Monday. But we, have, we still have this me mentality. It's like, I just need to be pleading to myself. I just need to make sure that I'm good and, and everything else and everything else can, can go, right? So remember that when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. The Lord, in verse, in verse 3 of Psalm 41, the Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. There are plenty around us who if not poor in the things of this world are poor in love and in hope and the knowledge of God. They might have all these things but if you like these things what do the other things do for you? Because you're still miserable. Upon reflection, he who considers the poor, that is the weak, helpless, and poor in broad measure of the righteous man or woman. He who considers the poor trusts God, willing to give from his own resources. He who considers the poor is kind to those in need. He who considers the poor helps those who likely will not help him in return. When we help somebody, or we're, or we're doing something for somebody, are we always doing it with the expectation of receiving something in return? Are we receiving something back? 
Are we doing it? Our, what's our motives behind the things that we do? Because seriously, we need to check our motives. Our motives have to line up with the Word of God. <coughs> if I'm helping you, I'm helping you out of love, out of generosity. Not saying that, that hey, I'm going to expect something back from you because Jesus has already supplied all of my needs. He who considers the poor has a generous heart. He who considers the poor gives for their good, not simply to make himself feel good. It is easy to become blind to the needs of others if we only focus on our own needs and feelings. We must reach out to help others in need. As we do, we will experience God's help when we are emotionally down or physically sick or when we face difficult situations. You know, my stepson, my oldest stepson, called my wife today to pray for him because he's having some back issues, some, and we've been praying for him and, and you know, it's, it's, it's awesome, not awesome because that's a lot of pain, I mean, he's going through the same stuff that I went through before my back surgery and, and he's going through this right now, but he reached out because he knew the source. He knows the power of the God that my wife serves. He knows that power. And see, sometimes, as we've been praying from, sometimes God will allow things in our lives to get our attention so that we can wake up and say, hey man, I need, we need Him. We need our Lord. We need our Savior. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> in verse 4 it says, I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. My enemies, in verse 5, my enemies speak evil of me. When will he die and his name perish? David has set a standard on the side of the Lord in his day. Those classified as his enemies were also enemies of the Lord. These enemies thought if he would just die and get out of their way, they could live any way they wanted to without a hurting conscience. See, usually people who speak evil of others are trying to cover up some sin in their own life. They think if they can make someone else look bad, it will make them look better. How many of us have known people like that? How many of us have been people like that? We try to, we try to, you know, we, we try to climb the ladder. The corporate ladder, right? We try to get that better job, that better position, that better pay, better this. So we're going to devour, de devour everybody else's names so that we can be on top. But if that's the only way we can get on top, then the, we, we, there's something wrong, definitely wrong with us. I think our work ethic is what should get us to there. Not, not by bringing other people down and talking and slandering on slandering people and speaking lies about people. See, they were not aware that David would live on. God had promised that his descendants would reign. This was really speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ who will reign as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Amen. Amen. Jesus was in the lineage of David in the flesh. Wow. And then in verse 6, it goes on and says, it says, And if he comes to see me, he speaks lies. His heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes out, he tells it. This reminded me of the trouble that Job had. His so-called friends accused him of being a sinful man because he had this disease in his body. They had talked so badly about Job that Job had to pray for them before God would forgive them. 
Just as God punished the friends of Job for their iniquity, God will punish those bearers of bad news here. They are only pretending to be his friend. We've all, we've all known pretenders. We've all known a lot of pretenders. But like I said, we're trying to climb that, that corporate ladder. We're trying to get to the top. We're trying to get that better paying job at all costs. And then it goes on and says, Lord, be merciful to me. Without, without saying it directly, David seemed to appeal to God on the basis of his own good works, especially consideration of the poor. In light of his relative righteousness and according to the term of the old covenant, David could and did ask God for mercy and blessing. He said, heal my soul for I have sinned against you. David knew that he had done much good, but that did not erase his sins. He understood that his sins were directed against God and that they made him like a sick or injured person who needed healing in his soul. His body was sick, but more important was his soul sickness. His soul, his soul was, was sick. See, we can identify at least three ways that David says he needed healing for his soul. Heal my soul from its great distress. Heal my soul from the effect of sin. Heal my soul of my tendency to sin. So he was crying out to the Lord, heal me Lord, but he was recognizing that sin was a problem. David made a plain and honest confession of his sins when he said, I have sinned against you. A confession without excuse. When we come and bring our, our burdens to the Lord and we confess our sins to, the, to our Heavenly Father, we tend to just want to excuse them. We don't want to really turn them over to the Lord. We don't really want to turn them over to God and say, here God, I have sinned against you. Forgive me of my iniquities because my sin was directed towards you. And that's what happens when we sin. Saul and Judas, he said, I have sinned. But David says, I have sinned against you. Heal me, not for I am innocent, but I have sinned. How contrary is this to all self-righteous pleading? So when we have iniquity in our life, when we have sin in our, in our mortal bodies, when we have sin in us, it's very important that we bring it to God, we bring it in repentance and true heart change and turn from it, turn Turn away from it. Really bringing our sin and saying, Lord, I have sinned against you. But sometimes we come to the Lord with an expectation, well, I'm bringing this, so now I, I, I expect you to do this. Is that bringing our, our, our transgressions with a pure heart? Absolutely not. Because we're doing everything that we're doing, we're trying to do with an expectation of receiving something. Jesus died for us. He died to forgive us of our sin. What is it more that we want? But we always want more. And we're trying to, to play a game of, of, of trading with God. Like, well, I'm going to do this and I expect you to do this. I'm going to do this and I expect you to do this. And when He doesn't meet our expectations, then we get upset. We get upset. We walk away from God. We start to have bitterness towards God. We stop going to church. We stop reading our Bibles. We start con being consumed by the worldly thinking again. And here we go. We're back where we started before. 
See how sin creeps up and tries to devour us away from our Lord? We have to be really, really careful. Verse 7 says, All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt. You know, we have to understand and we have to come to the realization about speaking evil about other people. We should not be speaking evil or be slandering people. It doesn't matter what they've done to you. It doesn't matter what we, what we need to start doing as a church body. Is we need to really start praying for these people. Because if we start slandering their names, guess what? It starts affecting us. It affects us. Not them. It affects us. Our relationship with God. And that's not pleasing to God. See, these, his friends, they were whispering things about David. They were trying to come against him, to devour his name, so that people wouldn't trust him, so that people wouldn't come to him. Isn't that what goes on now? Isn't that what goes on now in our lives? And you know what? I've been there before. I understand the damage that this causes. And us as believers that have a relationship with Christ, we need to stop it. The gossip and, and all of the slanderous talk, speech, we have to let it go. We have to cut it off immediately before it takes us with it. In Matthew twenty-two fifteen, 15, it says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. Hmm. Wow. Pretending to be his friends, they are really his enemies. They are two-faced. They do not say these things to his face. They get out and whisper behind his back. They really want to destroy him. They want to destroy who he is. They want to destroy the calling that God had on his life. They wanted to bring him down. And if you ask me, I think it was because of envy. Because they envied him. Because of the favor that God was showing him. Envy is bad. Right? That's why they wanted to destroy him. In verse 8 it says, An evil disease, they say, clings to him. And now he lies down. He will rise up no more. Basically, they wanted him dead. It is very easy to declare an illness that someone else has as an evil act of God. The person can even figure out how this illness is a punishment from God. Like Job's friends confessed. So many ministers today are proclaiming that all illness is because of sin. That is not true. The disciples asked Jesus, who has sinned? The blind man or his parents? Jesus answered them and said, neither one. We must be careful about proclaiming someone else's illness as a judgment of God. See, the Bible says that all good things come from God our Father. And it's very easy to put labels on things. Oh, it's because that guy's in sin. That guy's in sin. That guy's in sin. Take a look at Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. And he had an illness. Why didn't God heal him right at the moment? God could have done it. But there was a purpose for it. Because overall, God was glorified through his infirmities as well. Sometimes we need a little nudge that helps us remember and remind us of who God is.
You guys still with me or did I lose you guys last year? No, 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 we're here. We're here, we're here. Hmm. In Luke 6.37 it says, Judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. See, this scripture a lot of people have taken it out of context. Especially within the body of Christ when, when you're trying to correct a brother in righteousness. There's a difference between judging and correcting. And when we try to correct a brother or a sister in righteousness and holiness, it's always like, even the world, you, who are you to judge me? You can't judge me. You can't judge me. And the reason they get so defensive is because of their sin. Their sin has them hold their sin has them holding hostage. They're hostage to their sin. We were once hostage to our sin. We belong to our sin. Our sin owned us. Why? Because we would always give in to it. And it owned us. It became our master. You guys are like, no, no. That's not right, Pastor, because I used to sin, but sin becomes, we become a slave to sin. If we continue to indulge in the things of this world and continue to indulge in sin. God wants to forgive us once and for all. He wants us to repent. He wants us to turn away from sin. He wants us to walk righteously. He wants us to walk holy. As we are children of the Most High God. And in verse 9 it says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. It is bad enough for our enemies to speak out against us, but when a close friend turns against you, it is almost unbearable. Judas Iscariot called Jesus friend, and yet he betrayed him. Many of us who are trying to get something done for God have felt this very same hurt. Many times it's your closest friend who you thought had been in total agreement with you. I have even felt this hurt from family as well. There is no way to ignore this type of hurt. The only consolation that we can do, or we can have is we have not suffered to the extent that our Lord Jesus Christ has suffered. But we always say, man, poor me, poor me. And we start feeling sorry for ourselves and we start beating ourselves up and we start doing all these things that we shouldn't be doing. Even through the midst of the storm, we got to continue to praise God. That's like when we have, we're surrounded by brothers and sisters so that we can lift each other's arms up. When one is weak, when one is tired, we can help the other one out. Because you know what? We've all been there. And there's times where, man, we just can't take one more step. But that's when prayer starts to make it take effect from brothers and sisters. Amen? All who hate me whisper together against me. David knew, or at least could sense, the whispered conspiracies set in motion against him, meant to devise his hurt. An evil disease clings to him. This may have been true. David described such a time of illness in Psalms 38.3 and also in Psalms 38.6-8. David's enemies were happy at the thought that he might die and rise up no more. I mean, I don't want nobody, I mean, I don't want my enemies to die. And these, these people wanted David, they wanted to finish him. They wanted him not to get back up. They wanted him to be out for the count. 
So we can imagine how his enemies, probably pretended friends, said this of David as he suffered on his sick bed. Even my own familiar friend and whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. David's woe was made more bitter because among his enemies were those who had once been a familiar friend to him. He knew what it was like when, when trusted friends, those he had close relationships with, who ate my bread, betrayed him. David was betrayed by his own son, Ab Absalom. Absalom. You can find that in 2 Samuel 15. And by a trusted advisor named uh, he, it's spelled A-H-I-T-H Athikopal. Athikopal. Okay. 2 Samuel 15 what? 12. 31, you can find that. What greater wound can there be than a treacherous friend? And the ultimate, most, minute, most sinister sense, this was fulfilled when Judas betrayed Jesus. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. Turned him in for 30 pieces of coin. And then he thought by, by he, he started to freak out. He started to freak out. He thought by returning back the coin that he would just, he just didn't want no more part of it. It's like you go to a bank and rob a bank, steal a bunch of money, and then you're so convicted and then you go back. I mean, there's still going to be consequences to face, right? You're like, you know what, I, I didn't spend nothing. I just got a piece of bubble gum at the Circle K and that's it. You can count it, right? But you still have to face the consequences. The kiss of the traitor wounded our Lord's heart as much as the, the nail wounded his hand. See, there may be people in our lives who hope we will fail. We may feel pressure from such people during times when our relationship with God is weak. We need to keep our eyes focused on God. He will never let us down. Our focus has to be focused on our Lord. Not on everything that's going around, uh, uh, that's happening around us, but our focus has to be our Lord. Amen. Our focus has to be our Lord and allow His will to be done. Amen. Amen. We're almost done. It's another 45 minutes. And in verse 10, it says, But you, O Lord, be merciful to me, and raise me up, that I may repay them. David is asking God to heal him, but more than that, to show these people that the Lord had, no, had not abandoned him. This very thing happened to Job. Job was restored of all that he had lost. You guys remember that? In fact, God gave him twice as much as he had before. How would that make your enemies feel? Like, wow. If I go attack him more, man, he's going to have four times as much. So I'm just going to leave him alone. Can you imagine how those who opposed Jesus felt on resurrection morning? Hmm? Can you imagine how they felt on that day that Jesus rose from the dead? That the tomb was empty? I mean, I just, wow. Probably thinking and sadder than they're like, man, we were just playing, Lord. We knew you were up God all this time. See, David knows that God is with him because his enemies did not overwhelm him. We can't let our enemies overwhelm us. 
And I'm talking about the things of the world, the people that are of this world, that sometimes they try to consume us into the world, into their lifestyles, into accepting everything that, that they do. We still have to stand for righteousness. Mm -hmm. We still have to stand for holiness. By us reaching them doesn't mean to partake in everything that they partake in. He's like, man, he, and this is a true story. I, I met this individual years ago, and uh, he said that the Lord had called him. His ministry was to go inside of the, of, uh, you know, the gentlemen's clubs. And to reach men, I mean, to in there. And I'm like, wow, I'm like really, like my God, like uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. See, He wants us to reach those that are lost, but He doesn't want us to partake in the things that they're partaking in. You know what I'm saying? There has to be a big difference. So we're going to go out clubbing with these people because we want to reach them. So we're going to start acting like them. We're going to start talking like them. We're going to start dressing like them. We're going to start looking like them. And there's no difference. They're going to say, well, you're just like me. You curse. You drink. You smoke. You do all these things. You, you're a womanizer. I mean, that's the same things I do. Then, I mean, there's no, really no difference, right? But God has set us apart. Amen. Just as he has set David apart. He has he set David apart. You know, imagine the Bible, <clears throat> the Lord calling him as a as a man after God's own heart. Even though the things that he went through. A man after God's own heart. Man, that is amazing. That is amazing. You know, because and, and I'm thinking that it's because for every time that Dave, David came and repented to the Lord, he did it wholeheartedly. It wasn't, he wasn't half-stepping. He was really sorry. He, was, he really felt remorse for his sin. He really felt regret because he had sinned against God. And he recognized and he brought it to the Lord immediately. If you read the Psalms, read his prayers. I mean, those are his actual prayers that he was pleading with God. But he was recognizing that his sin was giving him that separation, so he was, he was really wanting to turn away from it. And God knew his heart. His enemies did not overwhelm him. See, sometimes it takes a while for us to be victorious over our enemies. But if we do not doubt God, we shall be victorious always in every aspect of our lives. And in verse 12, it says, As for me, you uphold me, you uphold in my integrity and set me before your face forever. David is saying here that the Lord not only saved him, but saved his good name as well. This is like the Christian who is saved. They are not only saved from further sin in this life, but for all of eternity as well. David knows that God has forgiven him and that this is forever, forever and ever and ever. David prayed for mercy from God and triumph over his enemies. O oh Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them. David prayed not only for forgiveness and for deliverance, but also for triumph over his enemies. As the Lord's anointed, he felt justified in this and looked for God's deliverance as evidence that God was well pleased with him. Because of his heart change, because of his true heart, the true repentance, You know that the Holy Spirit cannot live in a half-surrendered life. 
It has to be a full surrendered life. We can only we can only surrender half of our life to Jesus and then the other half let the world have it. No. It has to be all or nothing. All or nothing. But, I, but how can you live this way? How can you live a righteous life? We can't. That's why we need the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why we need the ability that Christ has given us through the Holy Spirit to be able to overcome temptation. There's always a way of escape because God provides it. God always provides a way out. But we have to make the choice if we're gonna want if we're gonna accept that, that way out or not. And when we blow it, we need to come just as David did and, and be honest with God and say, Lord, I have sinned against you, Lord. Forgive me. I want to change my ways. I want to change my attitude. I want to change me. Change me, Lord. We're always praying for other people to change, but what about us? Lord, change me, Lord. Change me. Change my heart. Change my desires. But we look at people and we're like, man, I wish the Lord would change them. I need some changing to do. <laughs> and we refuse to look at our own lives. The changing that needs to be done is us. Amen. Is us. We're like, babe, babe, I wish so-and-so was here. Man, they needed to hear this message. Then you know what? You know what? You just missed out on what God had for you because we're so concerned about somebody else and we're not receiving the message that God has for us because God wants to speak to us every time we open up the Bible, every time we're in prayer, God wants to speak to you directly. But we're like, babe, babe, I wish so-and-so was here because, man, this was perfect for him. He should have been here, man. I wish he would have been here and stuff. And we just, we lost everything. Because we thought it was for somebody else. I'm kind of stingy when it comes to the word. Every time the word is spoken, I believe it's for me. Amen. Because God is still working on me to change me and to change my heart. You uphold me in my integrity. David felt that it was in contrast to his enemies. He was a man of integrity. We don't really see men of integrity these days. Integrity is something that we find very little of. Even in Christians, there is no integrity no more. People don't know what yes means. They don't know what no means. They're just like, well, I don't know. Maybe. You know, integrity is very important to our Lord. That's a good representation is to have a good, good integrity. Right? Because as long as you uphold your integrity, people can say whatever they want about you. People can do whatever they want about you. They can talk and they can talk and they will never triumph over you. Because why? Because of your integrity. Amen. It's pleasing to the Lord. Believe me, we've been there. So as long as we uphold our integrity and keep it going down the way and not be trying to hide things and say, oh, well, there they come to hide the water. You know what I'm saying? We need to uphold our integrity. It has to mean something to us. Our integrity is very, very important for our walk with our Lord. And set me before your face forever. This was the most important thing to David. More important than triumph over his enemies. To be set before the face of God meant to enjoy His favor and fellowship. Do we enjoy the fellowship of God? Do we enjoy coming to the throne of grace and just pouring out our hearts to Him and allowing Him to just meditate on His Word and allowing His Holy Spirit to just speak to us, to get us going each and every day? Does that bring joy to us? Or is this something, oh man, who? I didn't read my word today, I have to read the word. It's like, we don't have to do nothing. This should be something, a joy that we, that we should be taking part of.
You know, 2020 is going to be an amazing year. And I believe that each and every one of us is going to grow tremendously like we've never grown before. Amen. I truly believe it. Because you know what? We're going to be challenged this year. Yeah. We're going to be challenged big time this year. And we're going to triumph over any obstacle that comes our way. Anything that tries to stop us, we're going to just trample over it. But I hope you're ready for a good challenge. We're not gonna like set up a race out here and we're gonna run and stuff like that. So you don't have to go and start going to the gym. I mean, if you go to the gym, that's, that's nice, but start getting in shape and stuff because we're gonna have a marathon, you know? Uh, okay. We notice that all the benefits of verse 11 and 12 are in the present tense. David did not believe that God would bring them to him. He believed that he had them already. Amen. And then I like verse 13. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. amen. Blessed be the Lord of, it, of God, the Lord God of Israel. Many commentators believe that this is an end not only to this psalm, but to the first book of Psalms. Here Yahweh is honored as a covenant God of Israel. It was fitting for David to end the song with his eyes on the Lord, not upon himself or his enemies. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Yes. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord is to be praised as an eternal God, stretching from eternity past to eternity future. Amen. 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 <laughs> Isn't God awesome? Yes. Yes. God is, is so amazing. And you know, <clears throat> the Word of God is, is what brings life to us. It's the Word of God. If, if I wouldn't read my Bible or pray on a daily basis, I would probably be strangling a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Honestly. I mean, I'm just being transparent. But see, it's the Word of God that brings peace to our lives. It's the Word of God that brings just a sense of, of knowing that He's got everything in control. And I have to accept that I'm not in control of anything. He controls when I wake up, He controls when I go to bed, and He controls my day. We need to let go of our control and allow Him to start to take control. Because He knows way better than what we know. That's right. Amen. 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 As I begin to close, I want to do something. Is, is I want to bring everybody forward because I want us all to pray out. I mean, we're almost to 2020, we're almost to Christmas, and I just want to just say corporate prayer, with all of us holding hands as a family, knowing that, that God is going to do a great work in each and every one of us this coming year. Amen. Amen.